to uh, chapter 6. Chapter 6 is really short. It used to be part of another chapter. Again, it was split out. And we're going to do the first half of uh, chapter 7. Um, chapter 6 <coughs> is basically just an introduction to the notion of organic reactions and organic mechanisms. Chapter 7 reviews things that we have said about alkene, and then we will do alkene nomenclature today. After that, the last half of chapter 7, chapter 8, and forevermore is real organic chemistry. Now, chapter 8 especially um, can be exceptionally overwhelming. Uh, you will learn a phenomenal amount of material in chapter 8. Uh, that's why if we get the first half of 7 done today, we can spend more time on 8 so that you're not so shell-shocked. Um, doing it all in a very compressed time, like over the summer, makes it even more difficult because it doesn't have a chance to sink in. So we'll try to spread it out as much as possible. This is a really cute little movie we'll see um, again in a little bit. This is a substitution reaction. It's a calculation, obviously. I want you to notice the central carbon here. What happens to it during this reaction, you'll note in the middle, it goes entirely planar. Putting this in context of chapter 5, stereochemistry, if this was a chiral center during this reaction, it would undergo inversion. That is, if it started off R, it would be S, then it would go back to R and S and all that S. So we'll talk more about this. In, I think chapter 11 is where we do great detail about SN2 reactions. All right, just as a general overview, types of reactions. Um, addition reactions. All we're going to do is take two or more things, we're going to combine them, and we're going to make something new. Elimination. We're going to start with something and rip something out. Typically, we will use this to make alkenes. Substitution, example of what we just saw. Something comes in um, and something leaves. <clears throat> and finally, rearrangements. Rearrangements are such a really neat part of organic chemistry. Um, we'll just look very, very quickly at simple rearrangement today. Um, <clears throat> next semester, when we're better at this, we can look at <clears throat> more challenging rearrangement problems. It's basically where the carbon skeleton undergoes a simple rearrangement in connectivity. Our additions. <clears throat> what we're talking about is taking two things and adding something to it. For example, let's look at this alkene. This is ethene. Two carbons, so it's an ethene because it's an alkene. Alkenes react with HBr. When they do, you form, uh, in this case, bromoethane. What we've done is add the elements of HBr to our starting material here, the H and the Br. Um, we will talk about this reaction in this chapter a little bit, talk about the mechanism and things like that. Things that control the orientation of the addition of bromine and hydrogen. Elimination. Like I said, we're going to take um, a compound and we're going to remove something. Um, in this case, we're going to start off with ethanol. Um, it's a simple alcohol. And what we're going to do is remove the elements of water. Hydrogen and an OH, the OH will leave with its electrons, and we wind up with an alkene in this place. Uh, this reaction goes in both directions. There are apparently large gas wells in Texas that contain high concentrations of ethene. Uh, these are then hydrated with water in the 
presence of a catalyst to make ethanol. Um, millions and millions of gallons. Plant um, is under great protection because this is the alcohol of commerce, you know what you drink, and they want to make sure that nobody is there sipping away. Substitution. The substitution reaction we're going to look at here is a simple reaction involving uh, an alkane reacting with a halogen in a light catalyzed reaction. Um, you will have a problem on your second exam where you will be asked to show the steps in detail of one of these types of reactions. <clears throat> what we're doing in a substitution here, we are removing a hydrogen, we're taking a chlorine, we're substituting the chlorine for where the hydrogen was, hence substitution. Finally, rearrangement. Like I said, these are cute. Um, if we take this particular alkene, so this is one butene, and we place this in the presence of an acid catalyst, let it stew for a while, you'll see that what you wind up with is a mixture that is mostly two butene. <coughs> This type of rearrangement um, is also used in what's called cracking, where you take petroleum and you break it down into simple small things. Trying to figure out the mechanism for some rearrangements is really a fun, challenging part of organic chemistry. All right, when we do organic mechanisms, we're going to show those mechanisms using little curvy arrows like we've seen in the past. Basically, what we're going to do is show the flow of electrons from one atom to another. We're going to do our bond making and bond breaking two ways, <coughs> homolytic or heter heterolytically. In a homolytic reaction, we're going to take a bonding pair of electrons and we're going to split them so that one atom winds up with one electron, the other atom with the other electron. We break our bond homolytically. They each get one electron. A heterolytic reaction, much more common. We're going to take an electron pair from our bonding, um, our sigma bond here, Going to move that electron pair onto one atom, wind up with a pair of ions, cation and an anion. You'll note that when we draw the little curvy arrows for a homolytic and a heterolytic reaction, they're slightly different. If we're only moving one electron, you use half an arrowhead. Okay? Half an arrowhead for one electron. <coughs> A full arrowhead for two electrons. A detail, but still important. <clears throat> transfer one electron, this arrow, transfer two electrons, a full arrowhead. These are polar reactions <coughs> because we're generating ions. The Homolytic reactions are radical reactions because we're generating an unpaired electron species. Polar radical. Now, we're going to talk about a simple homolytic free radical reaction here. If you take methane, and you put it in the presence of something like chlorine. Now, both of these are gases. If you just put them in a little dark container and set them on the shelf, not really very much happens. It just sits there. However, if you shine a light on it, you get a reaction. The reaction starts, it goes, and the product that you wind up with is chloromethane and HCl. 
<clears throat> this reaction can be described as having three distinct steps. An initiation reaction. This is going to be a free radical process. So in the initiation step, what we do is a homolytic splitting of covalent bond to give us radical species. Remember, a radical simply has a single unpaired electron. After we make radicals, we do the propagation step. In the propagation step, we're going to take and do a cyclic mechanism that goes over and over and over and over and over again, starting with our starting material and giving us product. And finally, termination. That's when it's all over. We're dealing with radicals, single unpaired electrons. If these guys combine, then the propagation stops. That's termination. Now, this particular reaction <coughs> does have a little bit of a history in terms of teaching organic. Many years ago, there was a text called Morrison and Boyd. It was the original attempt to present organic chemistry with a functional group approach. It was very, very successful. Everybody used Morrison and Boyd. I did too. Um, and every textbook that was written since then was basically, the authors would say, make it just like Morrison and Boyd. Well, the first reaction that they did was this one. Common mistake for organic students was that since this was first, it was the most important. Well, it's not. They put it in because they thought it was simple. It's not really that simple either. But because of that, all texts start off with this type of chemistry. Again, this is essentially a useless reaction. But not the most important is perhaps the most useless but historically, it's always here first. So let's look at this and let's break down our three steps for our free radical halogenation. We start off with initiation. Why do you need to shine a light on this stuff to make it go? What you're doing, the light is breaking the bond between the chlorines. In our initiation step, we are making radicals. <clears throat> Very simple reaction. Light comes in, it's absorbed by the chlorine molecule, the bond splits homolytically, and we get two chlorine radicals. Propagation is a little more interesting. In propagation, you want to start with a free radical species and end up with the same free radical species. That way, the reaction runs as a cycle. <clears throat> step one in our propagation step. Radicals are very, very reactive. They only have this unshared electron. They really want to take an electron from something. There's lots of methane in the pot. What happens is the chlorine radical will extract a hydrogen atom, that is hydrogen with its electron, with one electron, and form HCl. Once we have HCl, the other electron from our covalent bond here is left on the carbon, and we have a carbon radical. Now, the carbon radical is much more reactive than the halogen radical was. What's going to happen next is the carbon radical is going to react with another mole of chlorine. When it does this, it'll rip off a chlorine atom to form chloromethane. And we'll reform our chlorine radical. So if you add this up, the chlorine radicals cancel. We simply go from <coughs> methane to chloromethane and HCl. That is propagation. 
important thing to remember, you must start with a radical, and you must wind up with the same radical. And finally, termination. If we happen to have a methane radical flying around, and instead of finding a Cl2, it happens to find a chlorine radical, these guys get together, form a bond, there is no more radical, and so the reaction stops. This is simple termination. Now, any radical-radical recombination can do it. Here we have two chlorine radicals making chlorine, chloro and methyl making chloromethane, or even two methyl radicals making ethane. Any radical radical recombination is a termination. Any questions? Now, on your exam, I can guarantee you that you will be asked to draw a complete mechanism for some free radical halogenation reaction. <clears throat> Remember, initiation. Yeah, question? Well, so like, can you go back to the slides? Two slides. Or like, yeah. Ask your question. Well, so like, when when you ask the, us to draw it, like, because there's like a slow and fast step, do we have to like, know which ones? No, you don't. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about kinetics in a little bit, but not particularly in this. Uh, for this, mostly we want to make sure we understand just the basic steps. So, on the exam, if I ask you to write an initiation step, remember you need to show the formation of radicals. Typically, it's just a light catalyzed homolytic cleavage. Propagation. On the exam, you should draw something like this. <clears throat> You want to start off with a radical, end up with the same radical. Start off with whatever compound you're using and wind up with a chlorinated compound that you're using. Does it always have to be two steps, though? Um, yeah, should be two distinct steps. To generate your um, radical, you need to take a radical here, reacted with something like chlorine to make the pair. And finally, if I ask you to do a termination step, any of them would work. Here I've simply done the methane radical plus chlorine to give chloromethane. Any radical radical recombination. Now on the exam, it will not be methane. It will be something else. But the basic steps are always going to be the same. Why is this a useless reaction? Because it doesn't stop until it's terminated. Well, not just that, but turns out, and we'll talk about this in more detail later, that once we make our first chloromethane, chloromethane forms a more stable radical than methane does. So, as this concentration starts to build up, this reaction becomes less favorable, and the chlorine radical is much more likely to react with one of these guys. That would give us dichloromethane, which forms an even more stable radical. So it would react with the chlorine to form trichloromethane, that would react with a radical to form carbon tetrachloride. So you always wind up with a horrendous mixture of products. Also, it depends a lot on the actual structure of what you're dealing with. Here, all the hydrogens are the same, they're all equivalent. So we would only get one of these. But if we had a compound that had two or three different types of hydrogens, we will get a mixture, even after the first cycle, of two or three different compounds. So it can be a real nightmare. 
there are better ways to make simple alkyl halides, and we'll learn those. What do you mean by different hydrogens? We'll see a pro an example of that at the end of lecture. We have a problem where we're going to look at a bunch of compounds and ask what types of hydrogens are there. Think about primary, secondary, tertiary carbons. They all have different types of hydrogens. All right, that was an example of a homolytic or radical reaction. A, an example where we have um, an ionic mechanism is going to be a substitution reaction, something like this. Now, a substitution reaction, we're going to react something with something else, and we're going to substitute the atom for it. We will talk, we will describe these things as being either nucleophiles or electrophiles. A nucleophile is something that has a charge <clears throat> that is, or has electrons, and is seeking a positive center. It is positive loving, nucleophile. An electrophile is something that would love to have some electrons. So it's just the opposite. It will be a polar covalent bond, usually. So if we take chloride, we can do a reaction with the electrophile. Now, this is chloromethane. This is the electrostatic potential map. And as we've talked before, the coloration indicates charge distribution. In chloromethane, we have a very polar covalent bond, and the electrons are focused down here towards the chlorine. That leaves this carbon positive. Because it's positive, it would love to have electrons. It is the electrophile. Nucleophile is going to attack the electrophile. We show the reaction using our curved arrows. We want to start off at the place where we have the electrons as our nucleophile. We're attacking the electrophilic center. That would give us too many bonds here, so we have to break the carbon chlorine bond, and we wind up with chloride. That's this guy, and this is the new bond that we just made. This is called a substitution reaction. Specifically, it's called an SN2 reaction. We will talk about two types of substitutions, SN1 and SN2, and they differ on the actual mechanism of the bond making breaking. In an SN2 reaction, <clears throat> again, we attack, we break this bond at the same time. This is the movie that we saw. Again, all right is coming in, we've broken this bond, and the all right is leaving. Yeah, this, this might be a weird question, but uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, chloride, the bond that you're breaking with our chloride, what makes that? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. What, well, why would it? Um, because it can. <clears throat> I mean, it's a simple reaction. This is a nucleophile, this electrophilic center. They can react. Um, this is shown going back and forth, because yes, it would. If this reaction occurred, would you ever know it? Not really. No, you wouldn't. Unless, like I said before, look what happens here in the middle. This carbon goes totally planar, doesn't it? So if we had, not methane, but if we had a chiral center here, when it went planar, and then the other bond formed here, we would actually invert from R to S. Going back, we would go from S to R. If we started off with a pure compound here, pure um, enantiomer, we would wind up with a racemic mixture. 
So that's how we could tell it. If you think about this, this is like an umbrella inverting in the wind. It just plops and it's planar in the middle. We'll return to this in a minute when we talk about reaction coordinates. Addition reactions. We said that in an addition reaction, we're going to take something like an alkene, and the example we'll use here will be the addition of HBr. This reaction would go to give us an alkyl halide with hydrogen on one carbon and a halogen on the other. Even though this alkene has two carbons, we only get one product. The only product that's formed is the one shown here, and that is two bromopropane. Now what we're going to do is explain, rationalize, why this happens. Why we get this selectivity. To do that, let's go ahead and think about the mechanism of the reaction in more detail. We talked about alkenes as having this pi system. We said the electrostatic potential map looked like this had this big red swatch in the middle, where our pi system is. <clears throat> I said, back when we did the introduction, that this was going to be the center of reactions of alkenes, because that's where the electrons are. This is the diagram that we drew to show our pi system. Now, this is reacting with an acid. This acid is going to break into H plus and Br minus. Now H plus, well, it's positive, isn't it? It is a great electrophile. It is looking for electrons. Where is it going to find them? Right here. Our first step, our proton is going to come and just sit down on top of this electron cloud. Just goes and sits down. Now once it sits down and it's happy, we could undergo, or it could slide, if you will, from this side to here, from the middle to here, to form two different um, carbon cations. If it goes, over this away, this one, we will form this secondary carbon cation. If it slides this away to this carbon here, we'll form this primary carbon cation. The fact that we only get product arising from this means that this does not occur. We can rationalize that based on the fact that the secondary carbocation is more stable than the primary carbocation. So it actually makes great sense. We're going to break down our pi complex to form the most stable carbocation intermediate. Now we're going to go over this in great detail in a little bit. So this is just an overview. We're going to call this tendency to form the most stable carbon cation, Markhanikov's rule. Markhanikov was a Russian chemist, and basically he worked out how to predict where the proton and the halogen are going to add in a reaction like this. Markhanikov's rule. Yeah? Is that bromine supposed to be there for the... <coughs> Yeah, that one. Um, well, this product is not observed. Right, oh, yeah, you're right. This should be a hydrogen. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oops. So that's just that method yeah, that's, a that's hydrogen. making is making the cation. Right, uh, making the most stable carbocation 
That's my kind of God's rule. Now, he didn't say it that way, but that's what it is. Once we get the most stable carbon cation, VR minus will attack, and this will give us our product. Any questions? Again, in chapter 7, the first part of chapter, or the second part of chapter 7, we're going to go through this reaction in great detail and talk about carbon cation stability. Let's quickly look at an example of elimination reaction. Like I said, in an elimination reaction, what we're going to do is break something out of our molecule. Now we're going to do a lab like this, where we take an alcohol, an OH, and we're going to place it in the presence of strong acid. Remember, the oxygen has two unshared pairs of electrons, doesn't it? This can react with an acid to form, well, as we'll see, a protonated alcohol. Overall, we're going to lose the elements of water and make our alkene. Now, the mechanism. Step one, we're going to take a proton and stick it on our oxygen. Now, think about this. This looks a whole lot like water just sitting here, doesn't it? Looks like water bonded down to this carbon. And basically, it is. What we're going to do is lose this water. When we lose this water, it's going to take its electron pair with it. So here it goes. And we're going to form a carbon cation. Positive carbon where the water used to be. To make the alkene, all we have to do is take any one of these hydrogens, I just chose this one, we're going to take the proton off of here, move the electron pair in, and form our double bond. We'll see in chapter 10, I believe, this is how we do simple elimination reactions. Yeah? What is the sulfur? Hmm? Sulfur. What is the sulfur? The sulfur? Yeah, if you go back, what's on it? Um, sulfuric acid. Right. So, sulfuric acid is just a very strong acid. Right. Does it? Nope, it doesn't do anything. I think in lab we actually use concentrated phosphoric acid. <clears throat> Any concentrated acid will do. If we had to use something like HCl, what would happen next? Well, the HCl would add to that, wouldn't it? That's not a good thing. All right. I said we were going to go back to our substitution and talk about it in terms of a reaction coordinate. A reaction coordinate basically is an attempt to illustrate the progress of a reaction and show that relative to the energy of the reactants and the products. In this reaction, we said chloride was going to attack, chloride would leave, and we would make this pair. This is our nucleophile, this is the electrophilic center, and these are our products. Yeah? I think uh, in regards to this earlier question, the sulfuric acid added the hydrogen. Uh, right, that's it's a proton donor, it's a strong acid. The water but the sulfate part doesn't do anything else. It just sits there. All right, so let's draw a reaction coordinate diagram for this. What you're going to do is start off with your reactants, chloride and chloromethane. Negative charge should not be there, sorry. We're going to assign them some ground state energy some relative energy. We're going to plot the energy 
versus the progress of the reaction. By progress of the reaction, I mean the actual bond making and bond breaking process. We start off at some arbitrary level here. As we go and we make our bond, we're going to go through an energy maximum. And here's our final products at the same energy. Same energy because it's the same compounds. <clears throat> this peak right here is referred to as the transition state. The transition state is the highest energy point in the reaction coordinate. It is not an intermediate. <clears throat> in the movie that we saw, this would be the point where the carbon was totally flat, and the bond here was half made, and this bond was half broken. That is the transition state. This is the amount of energy it takes to get there. The more energy it takes to get to the transition state, the slower the reaction will be. Put these together. Here's our thing going. This is a reaction coordinate. This is our rate limiting transition state, right there. And you see that corresponds to our carbon being flat and the bonds half made and half broken. SN2 reaction, no intermediate, just a simple transition state. So are you just saying that there's no like um, middle reaction? There's no intermediate in the reaction. It's no intermediate. Now, that differs from what we saw with the addition of HBr. Remember, in the addition of HBr, we started off with our reactants. Here we go to our bromoalkane. But our first step was the formation of the carbocation, right? That is an intermediate. Now, when you have an intermediate and you're writing a reaction coordinate, what you do is you start off down here somewhere. Our energy goes up. This is our highest energy level. This is our transition state. This is going to be the slow step because it takes the most energy to get up there. Once we get past that point, we're here. Here's our carbocation. It's a real thing. Because it's a real thing, it's an energy dip in the reaction coordinate. So in a reaction like this, we have a defined intermediate. <clears throat> this is the highest energy. It is the rate limiting or the slow step. This is a faster step as it takes less energy to go this way than to go this way. Slow step as our transition state and this is our intermediate. The whole notion of <coughs> reaction coordinates is actually generally applicable to all sorts of reactions, all chemical reactions. <coughs> we speak of enzymes, biological compounds, enzymes, proteins, as being catalysts. The way a catalyst works is simply by lowering the energy of the transition state. If we started off here and we had a reaction that was not catalyzed, it would take a certain amount of energy in order to occur. What an enzyme does, and this is the enzyme lysozyme, <coughs> um, space filling model, can't really tell where the active site is, but the substrate will come and bind in this. This is it right here, the little cleft. It will come and bind in it. And when it does, the enzyme is capable of stabilizing the transition state. If you stabilize it, it lowers its energy. If you lower the energy, then the reaction goes faster than it would otherwise. 
That's how reaction coordinates are simply applied to things like catalysis. Any questions? All right, we're going to apply all of these principles in the next few chapters. As we talk about ionic additions first, then we will talk about uh, eliminations, we will talk about substitution reactions. So uh, this is just meant to be a general overview. The one thing, though, that I wanted to close up with is just this one little problem. Because remember, you will see the radical reaction on your exam. Now I said, the problem with a radical reaction is it is non-selective. We can get multiple substitutions, that's bad. But we can also get multiple products if we have more than one type of hydrogen in your compound. So the question here, very simply, and this is off an old exam. Identify the compounds below that would give a single monochlorination product. Which of these compounds will give a single monochlorination product? What we're really asking is, which of these has only one type of hydrogen. I'll pause for a moment while you look at the selection. Well, one way to do this is to simply ask if we have primary, secondary, tertiary carbons in our compound. Remember we talked about that nomenclature. This is ethane. These are both primary carbons, aren't they? We've seen pictures of ethane. It doesn't matter how you draw it. All six hydrogens here are exactly equivalent. So we'll put this in our list as one that will give a single product. How about this guy? These are primary on the end, correct? This one in the middle, however, is a secondary carbon. Therefore, we would expect to get chlorination in the middle, and chlorination on one of the ends. At least two products. Cyclohexane. Each of these is a CH2. Now we know that the hydrogens in cyclohexane can be axial or equatorial, and those are different, actually. They form different uh, stability radicals. But, Remember also that 10 to the 6 times per second, cyclohexane is flipping back and forth. So fast, it doesn't matter. All of these are identical. Here, we would expect to get a chlorination on one of the methyl groups. We also get chlorination here on a secondary carbon. Um, this is attached to a quaternary center. This is attached to a secondary center. Um, so these are actually different. We will wind up with three different types of monochlorination products. One on methyl groups here, one on this methyl group, and one on the CH2. Yeah. I'm just kind of confused about what you mean by different types of hydrogen. Well, um, think about, or just think about the type, the different types of products that you would get. If we put a chlorine on here, we would get chloroethane, period. Doesn't matter where it goes. All of those are therefore identical. 
chlorocyclohexane, they would all be identical. However, with this guy, we would get one chloropropane and two chloropropane. Two different products, two different types of hydrogens. Here we would get one, two, three different products, three types of hydrogens. Both of these are identical, aren't they? They're both at each end of our triple bond. We would get one product for monochlorination. And finally, the same thing here, right? We have a ring in the middle, but all of these methyl groups are identical. So it wouldn't matter which one you put the chlorine on, it would be the same compound. Okay. So bottom line, these four species have one kind of hydrogen, it would only give one monochlorination product. So you have to have primary, only primary carbon? Well, no, but they all have to be the same. I mean, the nice way to think about it is if we ripped off one of these hydrogens, we would make a certain compound, right? If we ripped off one of these instead, it would be the same compound. Again, it doesn't matter which hydrogen we rip off here. It would always be the same compound. This guy and this guy, however, we would get two or three different compounds. All right, let's take a quick break.